All right, so I just want to start here, actually. So this is, this is a real conversation. Um, I think the person I'm with is not in this room. No, okay, good. So I'm talking to the senior dev on our team, uh, and he's, he's explaining to me what I need to do to build a module. And he's saying, you're going to do call this, you're going to do call this class, and call this interface. And, and he goes on for a while, and he knows all these things. And I get to the end of this, and I say, I just look at him. I'm like, how did you, did you learn all of that, like, like, like the first time? Like, how could I have figured that out if you didn't tell me? Uh, and he stares at me for a while and he says, well, I saw it in a module somewhere. Um, so this was sort of a formative moment for me, because I was really expecting there to be some like great answer, like, oh, my IDE, like, you know, looked this up for me, or I didn't know, there was no quick answer. So, so our agenda today is to uh, <clears throat> show you how I built this thing so that, you know, Hopefully there's something in here that you haven't seen that now next time someone asks you how to do it, you're like, oh, I saw it in a module somewhere. Um, so we'll talk about what I was thinking, we'll talk about JavaScript it took to build it, we'll talk about some Drupal building blocks, um, which gets us to me. Uh, so I am, I am John Jameson, I am uh, on the Jill's team here uh, at Princeton. I'm an accessibility developer, um, so I focus um, a lot in front end, a lot in testing, a lot in like screen reader compatibility of websites, making things respond for like magnification, keyboard, um, all those sorts of often invisible parts of your website that are important but hard to, to picture. Um, so I'm going to start in the beginning. We're going to go back a little bit. So, um, so I really can't. This this is this is uh, Egyptian hieroglyphics. Uh, you get the bird over here and various symbols and things and, and some sort of funky multicolored thing happening in the middle. Um, and this is thanks to, to you pens from 1200 BC, so a while ago. What's going on here? That funky thing in the middle is supposed to be a bird. And that bird is supposed to be pointing to the right. Because it turns out you can write hieroglyphics right to left, left to right, up to down, or down to up. And they have some accessibility metadata, which is the birds point in the direction you're supposed to read. This poor carver, um, statistically, possibly had dyslexia for all we know. Um, but whatever it is, they carved the bird facing left. Uh, and at some point, someone looked at this stone and said, oh, I'm so sorry, you have to do that again. They plastered over it, which is the white you see, carved it in the other direction, painted it red. Somewhere in the last 3,000 years, the plaster fell out. And so now we see their typo in stone for all time. I like to start here because, so proofreading used to be painstaking. It used to be error prone. Um, your editors, you're expected to master a body of knowledge from arcane texts. When I started, this was this was the Oxford English Dictionary. Other people had to start with this Sumerian Akkadian bilingual lexicon. Um, you know, it's all the same. We had to like read things backwards. I mean, I don't know if any of you were in that era where you would like, because if you just start reading, you just just go right over all the typos, and so you'd actually like read lines backwards to look for spelling errors. It was terrible. What changed? Spell check. You know, all of a sudden you went from having to memorize the arcane texts to just, you know, automatically popping up, you know, something that was perfectly cromulent, finding your spelling errors. Um, well, that was great. Um, but accessibility. We have this whole complex world of accessibility, and it still looks like Sumerian Akkadian lexicons. The, the tools, they're great, I use them every day, they're powerful, but they were all built for me. Like, you need to know they exist. You need to be trained to understand what the heck they mean, and you need to remember to run them manually. Um, Princeton, we have more than 3,000 people creating websites at Princeton. Um, most of them, we only know that because of DNS records. I mean, they just crop up new every day, and, and we cannot chase them all down. Uh, they don't want to learn these things in the first place, and we certainly don't have the time to teach them. So I went looking. Um, I looked at more than 30 tools. I looked at every tool I could find. There was nothing. Um, the only thing I could find out there that looked like spell check was a tool called Sally out of uh, Toronto Metropolitan University. Um, and it, it just kind of worked. I mean, it, it had a little thing in the corner that would, you know, that you could click that would open it, and it would highlight the issue with some text that was brief and, and kind of to the point for people to, to not need to be trained. Um, and most importantly, it was installed on the site. So it was not, you didn't have to have first met a person to tell them to install this or tell them to run it, it was just there. Um, it was close. So um, I was like, I think this is, I think I can do something with this. Um, but I had no idea how. I went to my manager, and, and, and she gave me the time and support to look into this. 
Um, I thought so that, that you could minimize the tool. And once it was minimized, it was really easy to ignore. That was not what I wanted. I wanted to be more annoying than that. Um, I had even a couple features I wanted to simplify even further. Um, I wanted to, I talk too much, you're going to notice this. I wanted to write much longer tips. Um, and I wanted to improve performance because I wanted this thing to run on load on every page. Um, so I, I needed it to not introduce any jankiness to the site. Uh, so it's been three years. Um, version one, version one worked great. Um, there was even an image that isn't downloaded on the slide for some reason. Um, I went from sending emails over and over again to um, countless site owners. I'm like, oh, this needs alt text, or you know, this this link just says click here, things like that. Um, I started receiving emails uh, from people where there were alerts popping up on their site, and they wanted to understand more about what this accessibility thing was, and heard I was the person to ask. Like that's, that's huge. Um, and so then version two is now out. It adds all kinds of features that I, I've gotten feature requests over the years. Um, and that's what we're talking about today. Um, things things that require talking to the server really require a Drupal module. Um, so before we get a quick interface tour, if you haven't uh, played with this before, um, you save a page. You're editing in Drupal. You hit save. Um, loads the rendered page. A little toggle is going to appear in the bottom right hand corner. It's going to have an issue count. Hopefully, it doesn't have an issue count. Most pages have got to sleep checking. Um, it has a little issue count. If there is a new issue. You hit save, and the issue count on this node changed. It's going to automatically open. You could click that button and open it, but it's going to pop open. Bring open this panel. It's going to say, you know, I detected one issue or 19 issues or whatever, um, and start dropping tooltips all over the page. There's an exclamation point, a question mark, um, right in line with what the issues are. This is eye catching. People, people that haven't been trained, they notice when something pops open on your screen and starts highlighting things. You hover one of these. Uh, Tooltips or click on it, um, and it's going to pop open one of my talking too much tooltips. Um, but the point here is, is, is it's um, written for, for people who have not been trained in accessibility. They're not developers. These are content authors. Um, it's going to explain the issue in plain language. Uh, and a lot of the extra things I wanted to write were sort of explanations of why it's an issue um, and tips for fixing it. So this is, says, you know, there, this is a skipped heading level, and it explains that the heading nesting on the page. Heading one is like an indent in an outline, and like heading two is the next step out, and heading three is the next step out, and you know, you're supposed to think of this like an outline, and this skipped from three to six, it's pulling out from the content. Um, and from a screen reader, this sounds like content is missing. Like you didn't hear a couple headings, and you're supposed to go back, um, and that's confusing, and you know, um, to fix, adjust them. So, so the point is, what's the issue? Plain language, how to fix it. Um, and then there's some buttons. So if I'm not 100% sure this is an issue, because this is just JavaScript I wrote, I don't always know it's an issue. Or sometimes these are things where like, I'm just literally saying, could you manually check this? Like, Say it's an image that has been marked decorative with blank alt text. That is perfectly OK if that's what you meant to do. The image didn't have any meaning. It's just a divider, just a background, just decorative. Um, but often it means you forgot to fill out the alt text, and that is a so a lot of these, I'm really saying, just you know, this needs a human to check. Um, and you can say, hide this alert for me, and it'll, it'll stash some information and not bother you about this again. Or you can say, mark OK for all users, and it'll sync that to all other editors in the site. Um, it doesn't disappear entirely. It tucks into the panel. There will be a little button that appears that says, like, show three hidden alerts, things like that. So it's not gone. It just stops. If you, the issue count for the page goes to zero. Um, that it's all content tests, things like you know, links with no text, links that spell out a URL. That's always the best link. HTTPS colon slash slash www dot you know, when you're skimming, you love that. It really helps you find what you're looking for. Skipped heading levels, empty headings, all bold paragraphs with no punctuation that are fake headings. Um, that's really common. Large quantities of caps lock. It's not going to flag like one or two words in caps lock. Um, but you know, if you start putting your whole paragraph in caps lock and emphasis, it's a manual check. That's not forbidden. You know, that's not a blocker. People can read that, but it's just going to be like, hey, you know, maybe not. Um, it goes on. There's some there's 30 or 40 tests that I'm sadly going to share now. Um, this is less and more. So if you if you have ever used um, Wave or Axe, any of these tools, like the Axe Core Accessibility Checker, well over 100 checks, two or three times as many checks as I have. Um, so, I mean, it checks for things like, you know, ensuring landmarks are unique. You know, your average 
editor on, on the web does not know what an HTML lead marking is. If I flag that on a page, that's not helping anyone. Um, so it's less. I've cut out all these texts. So essentially, if you can't make this mistake in CK editor, I don't want to flag it. Um, but it's also more, because I'm focusing on content. So I'm, I'm going to be flagging things like, like tables uh, with no header cells. And I have all these manual, I'm not going to read all of them, but you know, all these manual checks, acts, these, these accessibility auditors, tools, like they don't want manual checks. Like they emphasize that like, the mantra for apps is no false positives. Um, so I want false positives. I'm helping people spell check all the time. You can say ignore this, add the dictionary. Like that's the tool I'm writing, something to help people learn these skills. Um, and check their, their work. So um, yeah, wrote a turnkey Drupal integration. Um, it has defaults for um, regions to check, elements to ignore, things like that. It has an admin GUI, has sync dismissals, has site-wide reports. Clearly, this is going great. All right, we're going to leave the taskbar on top, because I think when I'm in full screen, it is streaming things weirdly. Um, yeah, uh, there's a WordPress plugin I won't talk about today. That's for a different conference. Um, so, that's what the thing is. Talk's supposed to be about building. So, um, first building block. I had to learn a lot in JavaScript. Um, when I wrote the first version, it was jQuery. Um, that's all I knew. So, um, at its heart, this is going to be a lot of if statements. There's no magic here. I'm not passing this off to ChatGPT or whatever the AI buzzword of the day is. Um, it's just if statements all the way down. And so these are going to look like, you know, get the image tags, check each image for an alt attribute. If there isn't an alt attribute, display an error. If there is an alt attribute, blank, display the manual check of whatever. If, there, if it ends with .jpg, um, .png, display a, a, a manual check, um, it goes down the line. Um, you can read this. And that's surprising, because these, these accessibility checkers, they seemed so magical. And I always thought these were brilliant programmers writing this. And I just never actually just popped open the source code and looked. And so that was just a big career moment. Like, just look under the hood. And like, oh, it's just if statements. Um, so in jQuery, you know, a lot of developers are still writing in jQuery. Because um, it made DOM traversal really easy in V1. DOM is the actual HTML source code. Um, uh, as rendered, and so you would say like you know dollar sign you take where you get me you know ID of foo, and then you could say dot find you know find among the child elements some other class, and then you could say dot not you know go work through this array and knock out any of the ones that match this selector, and then go get me the text, and then, you know hi it's going to spit out if it ran on the source code. Um, converting to vanilla JS is a lot less forgiving. Uh, you try to do something like that, and you say, you know, all right, get element by ID bar, and get the text content. That's the equivalent. And when you get, you get an unclocked type error, document get element by ID is null, and execution stops, and your whole app crash. Why? Because it didn't find an element. And when I said dot text content, that function call says, well, I, you know, I need a parameter of an element to get the text from, and you didn't give me an element to check. Um, so any little mistake in JavaScript and it crashes. It's much, you know, it's more like a real programming language. jQuery, when it was written 20 years ago or whatever, you know, just kind of put in a whole lot of things to just gracefully stop if nothing came back. Um, JavaScript's not polite in that way. So I pinned these tabs for months. Uh, if you have not seen you might not need jQuery.com bookmark it. It's very memorably named. It's one page. And it's just two columns. And on the left is the jQuery functions that you grew up uh, using as an early developer. And in the right column is how to do it without jQuery. Um, boy, is that a handy web page. Um, the other one was uh, Mozilla Developer Networks, the MDN web docs, if that isn't something um, that you hit a lot. They tend to have fairly good introductions to anything with, with actual code samples of how it works. Um, so what did I learn? Um, Dom traversal. So, one of the things about learning JavaScript, vanilla JavaScript, uh, they learn very quickly is that the better you are at CSS, the better you are at JavaScript. So, the, the generic um, JavaScript, you can just do a query selector, and that says, I'm going to give you a CSS selector, and please go find this. Well, new CSS now, we can use things like an is selector. So, I can say, 
get me something that is, and give it a list, H1, H2, H3, H4. Well, I mean, how's that different? I could always do that jQuery. Well, how it's different is I can now also attach not to that. So I can say is H1, H2, H3, H4 not nav H2 or footer H3, and that is a single CSS selector. So rather than getting things, having it create a list of things to match it, and then doing like a not, where it's now going to take that array and go look again at each of these things and start knocking things out, which takes time, the browser just um, in one hit pulls every match from the DOM and hands it back. Really fast, easy to write. Um, you can chain things just like jQuery. So if I have some list of headings, I can say dot query selector on one of them. Um, and traverse down into it to look for something. I can say dot closest and go up to look at the, at the, the ancestor elements. There's like next element sibling, previous element sibling. Um, you know, it's all just in vanilla JavaScript at this point. Um, there's also something I found called optional chaining uh, that came into it a few years ago. Uh, so rather than saying something dot something, you can say something question mark dot something. Um, and that means before you go to the next step, test that the previous thing actually exists. And if it doesn't, return undefined. And so rather than your whole application crashing, you just get you know, undefined as the value of the variable. That can also cause surprises, because then if, you, you know, if the next thing you're going to do is get the text content, and then you check what the text is. You know, there actually is text now. It happens to be undefined. That's better than crashing. You can work with that. So editorially. So, um, my actual query selector, so one of the things I do is um, I let in the module, you can pick you know, what parts of the page should be checked. Because there's probably parts of the page an editor can't edit. So you might say, you know, okay, you know, I have this block and this section and this. Give me a list of things where you actually can edit content. So this will do a query selector all for those check routes, and, you know, main or footer content, something like that. Um, builds a list of, of routes for the content. And then it traverses into each. It uses dot for each. So I don't, you don't have to write you know, for i equals 0, i plus plus, i is less than length, all, all this stuff anymore. You just say, just for each, go through those things. That's nice. Um, and for each one, it's going to do a, like a sub-selection and say, query selector all is the selector list I'm currently working on, maybe headings, maybe paragraphs, whatever. <coughs> And then the ignore list, again, that's from the Drupal config, so you know, knock out dot ignore the paragraph. Um, so for the test we're going to look at first, you know, I would just, this would just be like, you know, is P not ignored P? Um, and so now I get a list of all those elements in the order they are in the DOM on the page. It works. And then I can start doing these magical if statements. So say the, the fake headings test. So I want to see if this is an all bold paragraph. So I go into the paragraph and I say, you know, is there, is there strong in this paragraph uh, that is not inside a table? Because I don't want to suggest people start putting headings inside tables. Um, and if I find that, now I want to get its text and start examining its text. So we have to get the text. What people do, old habits, bad habits, they start saying, oh, well, get me the .html. Stop. If you do .html, never do that again. That's what I'm going to say. You move into the JavaScript world. Boy, are you introducing OWASP problems, which I think is one of the next talks. Because um, as soon as you start reading and writing HTML, your stuff's executable. So if you get that Drupal config that has a script to run, you know, to Rickroll someone, and you stick that in the page, they're getting Rickrolled. Because you just said, add this script into the HTML. So you got to break that habit. Um, you can do there's something called inner text. So this gets the rendered text. So if you ever look at a page, you know, if you select some things and copy and paste, um, if there's some paragraphs there that are like hidden or display none, those are skipped because the browser takes the CSS and it calculates the like actual visible text. Inner text gets you that. Very useful. It's not what I'm looking for. Um, text content grabs the actual text node itself. Every HTML tag, there's actually sort of a fake tag inside it. There's a text node that is just treated as text no matter what. This just links that itself. That's what I'm actually looking for. Um, because what I want to do is I want to get the length of that text um, and I want to check it for punctuation because if this bold paragraph has a question mark or an exclamation point, that's almost certainly actually for emphasis, not a heading, so I can stop. Um, but I can get the length of this 
and I can get the length of the paragraph, and I can compare. And if they're the same number of characters, then I know that this is someone who selected their whole paragraph and did bold. If it's a different number of characters, this could be bold within the paragraph. There's other ways to do it. There's always a million ways to do it, but this is something I could conceptualize and maybe write. So, so that's what I do. If it hits all of those things, then I'm going to say, okay, I think this is a heading. Um, and so I'm going to create a dismissal key for me. So if I want to dismiss this, when you come back tomorrow, I want to try to recognize this thing. And the rest of the DOM on the page might have changed. So I don't want to save like where this is in the DOM structure. Um, so I'm, I, for me, for every test it's different, but I pick something identifiable. For this, I would just take like some of the characters in the uh, string, you know, and, and save copy that. And then I push all this to an array. I have this results array um, where I'll put like, the, the, the identifier of this element, so I can come back and do something with it later, that dismissal key, which test got tripped. Um, I build this list. I don't do anything else yet. Um, because what I've learned is, is for performance reasons, um, the instincts, and this is the way Sally was originally written, it's not anymore, because we're buddies, and we pass all this back and forth. Um, but he, you know, he would run the test, and then he would write the tooltip, and then he would run the next text and write the tooltip. And the thing about JavaScript is a lot of the properties you read are based on the, the rendered, painted page. If you change the page, the browser has to stop and paint the page again before you can read the next property. And so you start thrashing. Um, and this is a huge slowdown, like tenfold, hundredfold slowdown. If you're doing one thing, who cares? But if I'm looking at every paragraph, every link, every heading on the page, yeah, that's a problem. So you read it all once, and then you do all of your writes once, and there's a single paint event. Um, and it's faster than you can see. So performance reasons. Yeah, there's magic. Well, if I, rather than just writing things as I go, if I create this array, I can also do stuff with it. I can save things to the server. Um, I can run headless, so there, there's magic on what you do. Uh, and there's a footnote here to say, I'm, I'm talking about arrays, when Adam uh, backported this to Sally, uh, he realized it totally should have been an object, not a JavaScript person. An array is just a list of elements, an object, they're all named. So if you look at my code, I'm getting like, you know, results dot six, and he's getting like results dot title. Not any more performant, but boy is this code easier to read. Um, Users tolerate slowness on click, but not on link. That Axe plugin that I showed earlier, um, you click the, the scan button on that, it takes about a second to come back. Um, if you've clicked that button, that's not really a problem. Like, you feel powerful, you're running software, sure. Um, but if I had a Drupal module that introduced a second of the page freezing every time you touched a page, it would not be a module I recommend you use. So, you know, it's, it's under a tenth of a second in the, in the worst case scenario. Um, great. Um, and this really matters because uh, async is a lie. This is another thing I learned the hard way. Uh, when I started doing this, I'm like, oh, well, I'll just make sure all of my stuff runs in parallel with the page, because JavaScript has asynchronous functions. And so I started writing all this with asynchronous functions, and it didn't make any difference. I was very confused. Um, it turns out, uh, in browser, regular old JavaScript, unless you use something wildly fancy, is purely single-threaded. And so, jank, anytime you're on a page, you click something and nothing happens, or like you try to scroll and it kind of shudders or is slow, um, is because your click is literally waiting in line for the queue of running functions to clear. Uh, and the asynchronous functions, they don't run asynchronously, they just don't get in line until their callbacks ready. So, if you're using this to talk to an API, you know, you can say, you know, send this to the API asynchronously, and browser will hit send. And then the function will step out of line and let other things execute. And then the callback comes and it gets back in line and ties up the main thread. So it's all single thread. So um, what I ended up doing was breaking up my slow function. So you know, old school JavaScript, you can say window dot set timeout zero milliseconds, hundred milliseconds, whatever. Um, even a zero millisecond timeout introduces a callback. So if there's a whole bunch of things, users clicked on something and they're waiting for that click to do something. Um, the timeout gets in line and the, just sits in line until the line clears. So immediately the next step in my tests is not going to happen, you know, step three isn't going to happen until four, five, and six are done because they were waiting in line already. So this way I have all these little interrupts in my code that lets, lets the rest of the stuff you were doing in Drupal um, not be annoyed by all these tests I'm running in the background. All right. What else? So I said stop writing HTML. So I've now got a little results array. 
and I want to do something with it. So the, 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 the JavaScript way to create elements is to use document.createElement, and then you give it the name of the element you want. Okay, give me a P, a paragraph. Uh, I've assigned this to a variable, and I can say, okay, my paragraph dot class list. Everything in JavaScript has a class list. I can say add, you know, stylish to the class list. I can say the text content node should be, and just imagine something rip rolling here, you know, some OWASP vulnerability, whatever it is. Put the worst OWASP vulnerability you can imagine in here. And because I'm putting it inside a text content node, your browser will render it as the visible source because it will treat every symbol as text no matter what because it is text content and it's not executable. And then I can add it to the page. Um, that's the way to do it. It's verbose, it's annoying, it's bulletproof. As far as I know. Tell me if I'm wrong, please. All right. So I did that. I also learned about web components. I don't do any Penn State. Penn State? Okay. Every time I come to these conferences, Penn State people talk about web components, and I sit there quietly feeling, you know, a little imposter syndrome of like, what's a web component? I really don't actually have any idea. So I finally read the manual. Um, web components let you create your own tags, so you can define, you know, me. Ed Edley Elements tip is my tool tip. Um, and it's a tag, but more importantly, they have what's called a shadow root, which is kind of like a sort of porous iframe. And so the rest of the HTML inside of this, by default, any, any, unless you've done something special with your CSS, CSS doesn't cross the line. And so since I'm drawing my tooltips on top of someone else's theme, I'm not having my tooltips broken by your line height or your font choices or things like that. There's ways to, to cross that line, which you're welcome to do, but by default it means I stop having weird, weird things happening on the website. So I'm like, okay, I'll learn how to do that. Um, so there's boilerplate. I love boilerplate that you can copy and paste. Um, so in the JavaScript, there's, there's the browser defines uh, HTML element as this like base class. And so you can say, you know, you just make up a name, class of my thing, extends HTML element, and then you put in constructor is super, which means browser, just inherit the default, like div, essentially, just consider this a generic element. You know what to do with those. I don't understand how a browser works. Do your thing. Um, and then you can say custom elements, which is the browser's list of elements, dot define and give it a name as the element tip. That's what the actual tag would be. Uh, call this class. And that's it, now you have a custom tag. Boilerplate, you don't have to understand it, you just know how to paste it. Um, and then the browser provides a couple things, but the two I'm using. One of the first thing I'm using, there's called, it's called connected callback. So that means when I actually attach this to the page, you know, head or whatever, when this actually ends up in the, on the page, it's gonna look for this function in that class and execute whatever's in there. So that's where you can put like how to build this, what do you wanna do? So I can say, you know, hey, uh, browser, when this gets attached, check it for a data attribute, and I'm going to have a data attribute that is the number in the result array this tip is for. And so get that, add it to the properties for what I'm playing with, and then go to that Edley results array and go get this row. And I want all that stuff, I'm going to start playing with it. Uh, and I can say um, attach shadow, that's the copy and paste thing that actually creates that shadow break. Um, attach that shadow, uh, and I can then just start doing the creating elements. Create a div, attach it to the shadow, create a paragraph, attach it to the div, the rest of it is just HTML. Um, anyway, all right. Uh, CSS, if you've never written CSS in JavaScript, it's a text node. It's just a text node. You create a script element, and you create a text node, and you just write straight up a, uh, CSS in, in your uh, uh, in your JavaScript, uh, and in there you can pull variables. So, like I, you know, I have editorial, I have a theme global, and so I can say, go get whatever the theme text color is, insert it into my component, and append it to the shadow. Um, the other callback the browser provides is called attribute changed callback. So I can say when I'm setting up, uh, I can tell the browser to start. If it has this observed attributes thing, I can say observe. Um, that data attribute of uh, and the action. Observe that when it changes, call that. And so when it changes, the browser is going to go looking for me to have a function that's called attribute change callback, and it's going to hand it which attribute changed, what the old value was, and what the new value is, uh, and then I can do something with it. 
So like if it, if the new value is open, I can trigger my little function to open the tip. Okay, why does that matter? That matters because then the browser takes care of all of the thinking for me. So um, you know, on that panel component, which is a completely separate component, these two classes don't even know each other's names. Um, if you click that next button, that global main JavaScript has a function to, to go find the next tip and change its data attribute. And so the main JS finds the next tip, changes that data attribute to open, that tip then observes the change, the browser calls my function, and the tip opens. And I don't have to understand what's happening, I know how to use boilerplate. So now I use web components, um, and the rest is just HTML. You look inside a web component and it's just HTML. So I learned all that, and then I needed a module. And that's where that conversation on the first slide comes in. Um, you know, everyone is new to everyone sometime. So, here's a refresher, everyone here is a module developer, and here's an introduction to everyone here who's brave. Here's what I had to learn. So your module files. Um, there's a bunch of YAML files. These are human readable text files. Um, so Drupal looks at these for things like what permissions does this module need or what default settings it's going to have and all sorts of those. There are, jump down, there's, there's .php, that's going to be PHP. So you can have all kinds of PHP files. These might be completely custom. These might be implementations of things Drupal provides. Um, and then there's .module files, .install files, these funnily named files. These are just more PHP files, but these are PHP files with certain names where Drupal checks these at key moments, and if inside these files are functions with certain names, it will call them automatically. It was new to me. Um, lots of years of people saying, well, just write a preprocess function. And I'm sitting here at Drupal camp, like, uh, okay. I don't know. I mean, put, a, put some, create one of these, put a function here that's named this, and Drupal will automatically call it at a key moment. Okay. I can learn that. Uh, this was new to me, so if you don't get lucky, so Drupal, you can look in the, in the docs, there's a Drupal APIs doc, there's developer module developer docs. Um, sometimes these are well written, sometimes these are not. Um, you can check, you can check. If you don't find something, I mean, what I learned was the right question to ask is, what module does something like this? Because if I ask someone how to do this, they probably don't know the answer. But if I ask them, have you ever seen someone do something like this? Most people have, and then you can go look at that module and then see how they did it. Um, you know, it sounds basic, but it wasn't. Uh, everyone learns something. Um, you can explore core looking for something. Um, you know, once there's once you know the question to ask, there's decent help. Um, I didn't know what to ask. So, what are these look? So, um, dot permissions. That's that's one of these YAML files. You look in there. I'm starting here because it's really straightforward. You know, you open one of these up and it just has the name of the permission this module developer wants. View editorially checker. I would like you to have that permission in the list of available permissions. And it has a nice title and a description. And that's it. You created the permission. Congratulations. There's a dot routing file. It's not a YAML file. And there's more junk in here, but and I've, I've cut it off. You don't need to see it. Really. But, um, but again, I want to give the name of, 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 so this is to create URLs, custom URLs. So I want, I want the API report. I said I want to be able to report these things. So I'm going to create a, a URL for the API. And, and you say a path. That says, hey Drupal, I want this path. And then you say controller. And that whole big thing there is just where to find my PHP function that you should attach to this URL. Uh, and then there's, uh, the rest is like attributes. So methods, post, that means this is going to be an API thing. Um, and then you get permissions. View editorially checker. Okay, we create the permission. Now this, uh, we create a URL that, that requires that permission and Drupal will automatically authenticate people to try to touch this thing. <laughs> it's human readable. Now we have a route. Now we can go back to JavaScript. And now we can copy and paste the boilerplate to send data to Drupal. So it looks like this. You know, post data is there's an async function. It's not really async. Um, uh, and there's things in here about CSRF tokens, which is a whole bunch of stuff you don't have to understand, where Drupal's API will go make sure this person's authenticated and get them a, a token um, to make sure that they mean to do this. Um, you just need to know to copy and paste the right thing. Um, and it's going to go get that URL of my route, and it's going to go post JSON stringified data. And that's my massage version of the results array. So like, all I have to change here is like what the URL is and, you know, what data I wanted to send. Um, 
And so then it goes to that route, that route to find a controller. The controller is just in my file system. You can see source controller, API controller.php, colon, colon, report was what it said. And that just meant go to this file and get the function name report and fire it off. And so it, it's going to fire it off. Um, and what does that say? That says, you know, get, you create a variable called results, which is going to be the JSON decoded version of that, that array, uh, and go send it off to, within my module, um, this API other service function thing I've created um, called test results. And if that thing works, then tell the browser, you're good. That's it. That's it. So it goes on to this other thing. So I have another PHP file, and now it has this function called test results that expects a list of results, and and this goes on and on and on for pages. But it, you know, it's going to have like it's going to validate these things. So I have little functions to like make sure that's a number, or something like that, or this is a valid path. Um, and then it's going to do a for each, and it's going to go down each of these results, uh, and it's going to say this connection merge. And here now I'm copy and pasting from the Drupal database API documents. Um, and I'm going to want to just, it says, you know, you do insert fields. And so for the field named page title, drop into it the page title results. There's boilerplate, thank goodness. And then the database takes care of the rest based on the schema defined in the dot install file. For some of you, this is a review. I thought it was not. Um, and so this, this schema, Drupal has this whole schema um, thing built in, and you, you give it uh, a, this nested array where you're like, OK, I want the following fields, and I want an ID field. And that ID field should be a, a big serial field that can't be null, or whatever. And I have a whole bunch of fields. But you just list the fields you want, and then the schema takes care of actually setting up the database files, uh, database tables. Um, so we learned, and then you can reload the page, and if all goes well, and you hit your browser inspector, you'll see that, okay, I tried to send that JSON, and I got 200 okay back. Insert about a year and a half between these two steps, okay? Um, but it works. So now I have stuff in the database, I want to get back. I want to get back. I want to be able to hide these dismissed things. So that .module file, um, that is where you put things that Drupal looks for when it's building pages. So in my .module file, um, I can piggyback Drupal's global JSON object. Every page you load in, on, in Drupal, there's going to be this Drupal settings JSON object that Drupal is using for its internal stuff. Um, modules can piggyback this thing. So I, I want to put in there an object where it's going to be like, you know, what's the API URL and um, various other goodies that I, you know, that, that my JavaScript has in its parameters. Um, so this is this magically named function called page attachments. So editorially is page attachments, and then it's, you're going to end up with an array to tack on. So I can do things like you know attach to that attachments array the library of editorially, and now it's attached to my JavaScript. That's helpful. Um, I can say okay, well the API URL should be the it says URL from route, and that calls this Drupal function that figures out what the URL is for the named route from our YAML file of API report. Uh, and it's going to set that to a string. Which means if I ever change that URL, everything doesn't break. I'm not hard coding the URL. Um, or if your site's like installed in a subdirectory, I'm not uh, having a problem. Because um, Drupal is just going to figure out what that URL is. And so I can say attachments attached to the Drupal settings object to the editorially sub whatever that the API URL is that variable. And then I can attach, you know, uh, it says uh, uh, config get. So that says, hey, Drupal, you have this magical configuration system that I don't need to understand, but you can hand me from that a name or something. And I can say, go, go get the content group for my editorially config, which is one of the parameters on the uh, site. Um, so then we have, uh, uh, we have to actually get those dismissals. So Drupal has boilerplate for, for creating database queries. And so I can say, you know, hey, hey, query from this, this database that we're using and select my editorially dismissals table and go get the fields I named in my schema. And, and then you can set a condition. You can say, but only ones where the page path is the same as the current path. Um, 
and that's the Drupal boilerplate for database query. It hands back that I attach a Drupal settings array, and the rest is just JavaScript. Again, months, but um, but now that that module file ships with all of these JavaScript parameters. Uh, so the last thing, um, so I also have these site-wide reports. So um, these are custom pages. It's just more routes and controllers. These times they don't have that parameter post. These are just regular pages. So I have a, a controller that points to this this public functions results array, and the only thing in that controller is go get test results. Uh, and so that's going to call another function, and that's going to do another one of these database queries, and then it's going to for each of those results, and it's going to create an array uh, of rows. And each column in the row is going to be a column I'm going to want in the table. So if you can just picture this as just sort of drawing an array, this is just the data, but now organized into rows and columns. And then I get to that thing that I always nodded when people said render arrays. So Drupal loves render arrays. And what these things are is just um, things where you're telling Drupal what you wanted to draw for you. So this array is going to say, you know, I want a table type of table, the header should be my header variable, which is you know, four columns, and the rows should be that, that for each loop of you know, however many rows of columns. Uh, and you can attach extra things to it. Um, uh, and if you hand that to Drupal, Drupal then takes care of all the sanitization. And it just goes and draws up the HTML uh, and plunks your things in. Um, and these are all uh, documented. So there's, you know, look, it's a table. You might have seen it. Um, the form and render elements, I had this open in a tab for literally months. Um, and it's like, oh, you want to make a button? OK, well, give me an array in which it says the type is button, and give me you know, the value and so on. Um, it is, it's documented, which is nice. Uh, and, then, um, and then the settings, so config. So um, all of these form elements um, uh, in configuration, uh, there's this config form base thingy that Drupal provides. And so I can say, you know, my little class is going to extend config form base. Uh, and so I can say public function build form. This is what it tells me to do in the boilerplate. Um, and what that does is it takes care of all the thinking of like, you know, what, 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 uh, you know, what how to pre-fill these things and what to do with them when you're done. Um, and so I can say, you know, for the config, you know, config for this config page is editorial these settings. And then it's just render arrays again. So I can say I would like a, you know, whatever I want. I would like a text field, and there's the title, and I don't need a placeholder, and sure, give me a description with help text. And for the default value, which is something the form documentation told me I can provide as one of the variables, I can say, hey, config, get the current value of the content root. And now when you load the settings page, it's going to pre-fill whatever you last saved on these things, uh, and Drupal takes care of it. So this was just endless reading of like, okay, I can I can copy and paste this, I can learn this, it's learnable. A um, couple more text, you know, so there's a schema and a settings. These are YAML files where you you tell Drupal what uh, fields you are going to have in your config, and um, and if you want to give like a default value when you first install the module. And there's two or three years of my life. Um, so take away, you know. Ask people where they've seen it before, and you'll go far. And uh, you know, we all uh, learned it for the first time. Some of us very recently. So don't feel like if you're on Slack, uh, I'm not going to tell you you're asking a stupid question because I just learned last year. So. Um, some URLs here, these things I mentioned. So editorially.princeton.edu. There's a there's a demo there you can play with some docs. And then um, the the project. You go to Drupal. You can go to Drupal Code. Uh, the GitLab, whatever, the source, view source link, and actually read the code, what was on screen, what was often truncated. Um, you might not need jQuery.com. Remember that. Any questions? Yes? How did you roll that out? How did you think of the users? Um, Repeat the question, please. Thank you. Um, how, do, how do I roll this out? How do I get people to use it? So internally, we have a lot of sites. So we rolled out internally. For testing, um, I volunteered to speak at conferences and things, and and got some word tested. The thing that really helped for me is that one of the first people that used it was a blogger, and he put a post that was like, "This is the best Drupal accessibility checker ever." 
So that was convenient. Um, so, but yeah, I mean, for the most part, you know, I just mentioned on Slack. I'm in Drupal, New Jersey. Like, I would just sort of ask people to check it out and, um, and things like that. So, um, yeah, there's a department at Princeton that was a, a willing guinea pig. We were a willing guinea pig, which really helped. Boy, were there a lot of bugs in the first version. Um, and we rolled out slowly to our, to our infrastructure. Um, yeah. What kind of usage numbers do you have? That was a slide that didn't load. Um, uh, there's, I think, 2,600, 2,700 sites that's running on right now that I know of. Um, then that's just the Drupal module. So the actual JavaScript library, you can use that anywhere, and I have no metrics whatsoever on that. Um, the Drupal module wrapper is just the reports and having a GUI for the um, Yeah, so it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's now it, but it's Stanford and um, I think UPenn is using that. I think they're Harris talk. Um, well, it, it's, it's, many of the users, I would say, are higher ed and government. Um, people where you, you, you have pretty strong separation of roles and you're very aware of your requirements under like the ADA and things like that. So, and, and a lot of multi-site, well, I would say probably the majority of my users are multi-site users. Um, just because they're like the ones Googling for Drupal accessibility checkers. Um, but uh, I have a project manager. Uh, I've heard several times the project manager, like, because you know, the people that I haven't trained, it's like when they're, you know, editing content and pop something up. Uh, you know, I think it's my fear, my big fear, was going to be annoying. It was really didn't want to be annoying. And so I, I really liked hearing people that you know, I'm doing okay I'm on the line between helpful and yeah. yeah. Could you just give a quick talk about the WordPress plugin? Just not technical, but just the relationship between this and the Drupal module with any differences or similarities? It's been out for a week, and I think it has four users, um, so it's a little less tested. Um, the JavaScript is exactly the same. Um, one of the key challenges in WordPress is that their, their workflow is different. Drupal very much has an edit, save, edit, save page, where you fall back to the page and see it live after you get saved. WordPress, you, you don't. Like, you save it in place in the admin dashboard, and you have to like, go click preview to see it live. So it's, it's less visible in the workflow. So one of the things I have, beta E in there is in their, their block editor where you're live editing, um, they don't use CK editor. So the thing they have has much more actionable containers with IDs and things like that. So I'm actually running, I'm injecting editorially into their editor, running it headless, and actually like drawing alerts inside the editor as you're editing. There's a much lower threshold for being annoying doing that. So that's very experimental and really waiting for user feedback to see what people because I can't draw the tool tips there, you can't dismiss things there. It's much more like spell check, which is kind of like drawing a little red bar and being like, you know, alert this doesn't have all the text. Um, it's not as actionable. The dashboard is all JS. I got very frustrated. After working with Drupal's renders arrives, at the beginning, I was like, oh my gosh, I have to learn all this. And by the end, I was like, wow, it takes care of everything. And you know, once I've gotten over the bar, it's like, okay, I don't have to write everything. WordPress, as soon as I saw I had to write everything, I was like, I'm not doing this again. Um, and so I instead just learned the WordPress API. So the dashboard in WordPress is purely JavaScript. Um, so it doesn't have as many features as the Drupal ones, um, but it, it, it's also um, a little simpler and faster. I don't know which I like more. So I'm, I'm looking forward to the feedback. Um, but otherwise, they're basically the same thing. We are at time. We are at time. So that's all.